Good afternoon. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be here today as our dear guest, Catherine Harold, will give a talk on civil society and social change in 21st century. This talk is organized as a series of talks within the Solid Care Lab of the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. And let me uh, introduce Catherine in just a couple of words. Catherine Harold is an Associate Professor of Public Administration and International Affairs at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. From January to August this year, Catherine is a Fulbright Fellow uh, at the University of Belgrade, here at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory, it is our great pleasure, and also at the Faculty uh, of Political Sciences. Uh, Catherine was uh, also a visiting scholar in Palestine and in American University in, Ca in Cairo, in Egypt. Her research centers on civil society, international development, and democracy. Her book titled De Delta Democracy Pathways to Incremental Civic Revolution in Egypt and uh, Beyond uncovers the strategies that Egyptian NGOs used to advance the aims of the country's uh, 2011 Arab Spring uh, uprisings. Today, Catherine will talk about her research on civil society and social change in 21st century. Without further ado, Catherine, please. Voilà. Uh, so, Dobardan, Dobrodoshli, i Hwala. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Special thanks to uh, Boyana Radovanovic and the Solid Care Lab, the Institute uh, for uh, Philosophy and Social Theory here at the University of Belgrade. And of course, thanks as well to the Fulbright Program uh, that is funding my, my seven months here in Belgrade. Today I'm going to introduce you to the arguments that I'm advancing in the book that I'm currently writing, which is tentatively titled Remobilizing the Masses, uh, Civil Society and Social Change in the 21st Century. Um, and in the, in the book, I look at how people are mobilizing for change, organizing for change in contemporary, creative, innovative ways, um, often outside of formal non-governmental organizations. So traditionally, when people got together to try to bring about change, um, they often organized through those formal NGOs, non-governmental organizations, or associations, or voluntary organizations, um, that were actually registered, okay? Um, and for decades, NGOs, I'll use that term, um, were seen as really the essence of civil society. They were seen as the spaces where people came together to challenge authoritarianism, to work collectively to improve the economic and uh, social development of their local communities, um, and where they, where they cultivated habits and practices of democratic citizenship. But lately, NGOs have really taken a beating. They've been accused um, of being more upwardly accountable to donors than downwardly accountable to local citizens. And um, increasingly tight, many would say harsh, government restrictions on civil society and on NGOs specifically around the world are constraining the space that NGOs have to mobilize people for change. So this has really led scholars, many scholars, to decry formal NGOs as being depoliticized organizations that are actually out of touch with the people that they claim to serve. So this leads to the question, has the rise of NGOs, as NGOs have proliferated around the world, has the rise of NGOs led to the fall of civil society? My answer is no. And today I'm going to draw upon four summers of ethnographic research in Palestine to show how people, and young people especially, are increasingly working outside of or fluidly with NGOs 
to advance change and to revitalize civil society as a sphere of citizen-led social change and civic engagement. So first, I will argue that the rise of NGOs did fundamentally alter the nature of civil society in Palestine. But then I'm going to introduce how young people in Palestine are organizing through three relatively new types of organizational vehicles, voluntary grassroots organizations, social enterprises, and community philanthropy groups. I will then um, reflect on the potentials and the possible pitfalls of international donors' attempts to um, and, and promises to localize their foreign assistance. Um, and I will also argue that this is not just a rosy story. This is not just a story of, ah, oh, the NGOs are the bad guys and these, you know, voluntary grassroots organizations, social enterprises, these new and innovative forms of organizing are going to, you know, just fundamentally retransform civil society in, in ways that are, you know, good for citizens. Um, it's a much more complicated story than that. There are some real questions about the sustainability and the impact of more informally organized groups. There are real questions, I think, about the potential for international donors to reach these groups in ways that um, actually help and don't hurt them. Um, and I will also argue that NGOs are not the devil. Um, their NGOs are walking tightropes between their international donors and local communities. NGOs are filled with staff who are very dedicated um, to working locally and to, um, to upholding that, that citizen-led mobilization. Um, but we also need to be realistic about um, the, the challenges that NGOs face. And so can we think about new ways to think about the realistic roles of NGOs um, rather than just an idealized notion of NGOs. So that's the roadmap for today. Let's see. Ah, super. Um, so to advance these arguments, I draw, as I said, on four summers of ethnographic fieldwork in Palestine. Um, 2016, 2018, 2019, break for a pandemic, and 2022. Um, and during those summers when I was in Palestine, primarily the West Bank, um, also East Jerusalem, um, historic Palestine, I did not go to Gaza. I was not able to get to Gaza. Um, but the research centered primarily on the West Bank. Um, I uh, conducted over 100 semi-structured, loosely structured interviews with um, civil society actors ranging from young people who were creating or joining these voluntary groups, um, leaders and staff members of formal NGOs, um, donor agencies, etc. cetera. Um, I also spoke with people who had um, sort of had been involved, actively involved in Palestinian civil society through different iterations of Palestinian civil society's, let's say, evolution. Um, to try to get you know a, as broad a sense of po as possible of the various transformations that civil society in Palestine has has gone through, um, I conducted participant observation, which was great fun. It meant that I went on a lot of hikes, cycles, and runs throughout the West Bank. I attended arts and culture performances. Um, I harvested crops with um, members of community-led farms. Um, this was great fun, um, and uh, I often, I, or I also spent a lot of time on Facebook, which was less fun than the hiking and the running and the arts and culture performances. But it turns out that social media is um, where many of these loosely structured groups are um, both organizing themselves and telling their stories rather than formal websites or you know, annual reports or these types of things. Of course, I looked at annual reports and websites of, of more formal organizations as well, um, but I really did spend a lot of time on social media. Um, and this research definitely focuces um, on, on Palestine. That's where, that's where I gathered the data. 
But what I'm doing is using Palestine as a lens to elucidate what I argue is a global phenomenon and is part what I'm here to study, to see what's happening here in Serbia. And I'm still in the very early stages um, of that research. Okay. So let me take you to Ramallah, which is the administrative capital of Palestine. This past summer, actually, summer of 2022, when I visited the office, the office, vaguely an office, <laughs> of a local community philanthropy group, a local community foundation. And I went to meet with the director, to speak with the director of this organization about community philanthropy in Palestine. And when we sat down for coffee uh, and for ostensibly an interview, uh, she began to reminisce. Since she was in her probably 50s, early 60s, and um, she reminisced about the 70s, the 80s in, uh, in Palestine. Um, she reminisced about the loosely structured popular committees, mass movements, etc., that characterized um, Palestinian civil society at the time. Now, it's important to note, I, I want to give you a bit of background on this woman. She was currently leading a very small community foundation. Um, she also, though, had a background where she had worked for international and uh, international NGOs, um, some large local NGOs. She had spent some time in the government. Um, she also was an activist herself, and she had a side hobby preserving Palestinian recipes. She was doing a lot of cooking to try to preserve um, uh, recipes and, and traditional ingredients. And so she reminisced about this time um, uh, in Palestine before the first uh, Antifada, and she said, you know, the 70s movements in Palestine were an amazing time. The Popular Front, the Communist Movement, Fatah, they all started then. In the first Antifada, there were grassroots groups, popular committees, a popular front, unions. I was alive then. I know who was doing the work. Now, she wasn't the only one who reminisced about these 70s and 80s um, in Palestinian civil society. Nearly all of my interlocutors did, both those who were alive at that time and young people who were not yet born but who had heard stories from their parents and from their grandparents about this time. Um, and it was seen as a really rosy time in Palestinian civil society, very um, exciting time um, when civil society was comprised primarily of popular committees, um, locally rooted uh, self-help groups, um, and the mass movements that were seen to really undergird um, the first Antifada. And these organizations, or these groups really, um, often provided uh, social services in the name of solidarity, in the name of, um, of, 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 of nation building, and in the name of, of national liberation. Um, but then things in civil society changed. That's not where I wanted to take you. Aha. Uh -huh. There we go. There, that's where I wanted to take you. I want to take you to 1993 and the signing of the Oslo Accords, after which, sort of, you know, at which point foreign aid began to pour into Palestine. Okay? And this constructed, this aid constructed a sector of um, a very professional NGOs. NGOs really, the NGO sector really um, ballooned in Palestine. Um, reports from 2016 data are always hard to come by, suggest that there were around 3,000 NGOs in the West Bank alone. Um, again, that's an old number. I don't, I, I'm still looking for the current number. Every, nobody seems to have it. But in any case, a professional NGO sector ballooned. And, and these NGOs were, were and are, um, not the types of those very locally rooted organizations um, and groups that I was talking about earlier and that so many of my interlocutors um, sort of idealized. Rather, they were um, professional organizations, and are professional organizations 
um, that tend to be based in the large cities and, and not deeply rooted um, in communities. Um, and they are seen as being very professional, bureaucratic organizations that are more upwardly accountable to donors than downwardly accountable to citizens and to communities. And so what is it? What, what transformed um, what has been described over and over to me as the civil society characterized by informal mass movements into this bureaucratic NGO uh, sector? And the, 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 my interlocutors, at least, and, and my analyses suggest that funding is at least partly, if not largely, if not almost exclusively to blame. I don't want to say exclusively. That's way too strong a statement. But that funding is a major culprit, and specifically funding from international donors, right? Um, so what is it about um, funding that, um, that has transformed the sector? Well, I would argue that there are sort of three mechanisms through which this funding works. Professionalism, bureaucratization, and upward accountability. So let me take each of those three in turn. On the professionalism side, right, in order to um, basically manage grants uh, from international donors uh, and manage contracts and subcontracts, um, organizations tend to have to be pretty professional, right? They need professional offices. They need highly educated staff who are fluent in the languages of international development, of democracy, as typically the West defines it, um, and often the language of English. Application reporting forms are often, um, you know, written in the English language. Um, these highly educated staff, um, in Palestine at least, this is not universal um, necessarily, but are often relatively highly paid. In Palestine, the most highly paid jobs are NGO jobs. The most lucrative industry, as at least explained by my interlocutors, is the NGO sector. By far, more than banking, more than law, the NGO. If you want to make money in Palestine, and if you want to advance your career, you work for an NGO. They're highly professional, highly lucrative organizations um, that offer some of the highest salaries. Bureaucratization. All right, anyone who's ever applied for international aid, and I know that there's folks in this room who have and who do so regularly, um, you know, understand that there's a certain bureaucracy that comes with, uh, with, with applying for and um, sort of managing uh, grants from foreign donors, right? Um, application forms require organizations to structure their work like business plans um, that identify <laughs> clear goals, um, clear timelines, often short time frames, um, results that, you know, or, or anticipated the results or anticipated results that are measurable, these types of things, right? Organizations must regularly report on the progress that they're making, um, often using metrics, uh, quantitative metrics, right? Um, X number of people came to this training. Oh, and here's a photo to prove that X number of people came to this training, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, and the projects on which organizations are reporting are often relatively short-term in nature, right? One year, three years is a really long grant. Um, but we know that social change doesn't happen in short time frames with neatly measurable results, right? Social change is a really messy process that plays out over the long term with maybe results along the way or progress along the way that's really difficult to measure. So there's this bureaucratization that comes with foreign funding that can be really distracting. It requires time, it requires resources, and it can, you know, pull NGO staff away from a strong focus or an ex at least an exclusive focus on their mission. They spend a lot of time and resources managing grants. And then finally, upward accountability. How many donors out there are giving general operating support to organizations to do their mission-related work that donors ostensibly care about, right? Donors are rarely providing general operating support, saying, okay, NGO, we really believe in your mission. Here's X number of thousands of dollars or whatever it is per year. Take this, pay your staff, keep your lights on, 
do the long-term organizing work um, that you aim to do. Instead, um, of course, funders provide short-term grants for projects, for short-term projects <laughs> that uh, require organizations to deliver measurable results. And too often, funders are not funding the types of projects that NGOs themselves are proposing and that NGOs themselves have prioritized or that the community members that NGOs work with have prioritized. Instead, my interlocutors described a supermarket of projects um, laid out by foreign donors. And into the supermarket walks the NGO with its cart. And a number of projects are laid out that the donor wants to have or that the donor wants to see um, completed. And so the NGO can pick and choose among the, the, you know, the, the array of offerings of projects and uh, bid to undertake those projects, right? So this, this tends to lead to more upward accountability where the, um, the NGOs are, are responding to the priorities of the international donors rather than to the priorities of, of everyday citizens. Now, this is a really extreme story that I'm laying out, right? Obviously, it's more nuanced, and there are many people in this room who can talk about that nuance. Um, but this is the story that I heard over and over and over again from my interlocutors in Palestine who were working in NGOs, who had worked in NGOs, and who were really frustrated by this process. Um, and yet they had no choice. They needed the money. So here's a quote from one. Um, or let me just say that the result of this, right, at least in the context of Palestine, the result of this professionalization, bureaucratization, upward accountability, was to transform civil society, was to first marginalize a culture of volunteering. Volunteering today in Palestine. Nobody believes in volunteering. Volunteering is not seen as voluntary. You volunteer to earn some pocket money, to have lunch at a fancy hotel, to um, be noticed and known by NGOs who might potentially give you a job someday, and to graduate from university. Nearly all, all universities in Palestine require students to volunteer in order to graduate. And you can imagine how students uh, navigate that uh, requirement very creatively. Um, so volunteering is seen as not voluntary these days. Um, and it also uh, has been argued by my interlocutors to have marginalized um, this, this culture of mass mobilization, this culture of self-help, this culture of community-based organizing, right? And so one of my interlocutors said there's really a paradox between the micro and the macro levels. At the micro level, every NGO will say that they have a good project. But at the macro level, things become harder. Foreign aid skips the important stage of ending the occupation. Small topics are very important, but we need the big picture. And what my interlocutors were arguing here is that the number one issue in Palestine is the occupation. And those mass movements that I described from the 70s, from the 80s, were all focused on combating occupation. And what has happened now, or, or how civil society looks now, is a bunch of NGOs who are fighting small, <laughs> they're not small, right? They're not small fights. Um, women's empowerment, um, employment, youth empowerment, you know, these, these are not small issues, human rights, these are not small issues. But what my interlocutors would argue is that Foreign aid has constructed NGOs that are very, very narrowly focused on certain topics and that compete against each other for funding and for prestige and fail to work together to combat the occupation. That's the argument. Now, none of this is really surprising, or at least none of this was really surprising to me, because before I started my research in Palestine, countless scholars told me this is all I would find that aid had transformed civil society, that there were just these NGOs. Um, and literature has begun to document this, not just in Palestine, as I said, around the world. Um, the literature on sort of civil society that, that for decades really um, glorified NGOs is now critiquing NGOs um, as, as being these problems because of this funding. But 
in Palestine, it's not the whole story. So I want to take you um, back to 2018, that summer. Um, I, I, I went to go to Beit Sahur, which is a, um, a town near Bethlehem in the West Bank. And um, I had gone to Beit Sahur to meet with the, um, a, a youngish man who had created a, a voluntary organization that gave what he called political tours. Okay? Um, but instead of sitting down for an interview right away, and I, all, I also wanted to hear his perspectives on civil society in Palestine. And instead of just sitting down for an interview, um, he put me to work frying cauliflower. And as we fried cauliflower, um, I got an earful about his perspective on civil society. And it was basically what, all that I just went through, right? Foreign aid has just transformed civil society for the worst. Um, he had he had described himself as, as, or himself as having sold out by working for an NGO for, for many years, but that he got out of this. Um, but he didn't just complain about the foreign aid and the transformations. Um, he decided to do something about it, which was he created this voluntary, he got out of the NGO sector, um, and he created this voluntary initiative that, that led, or that still leads, um, what he refers to as political tours. So it, it um, you know, invites people from, uh, from around the world, really, to come to Palestine and, and takes them around, uh, you go to the, the, the dividing wall, you go to, you see Israeli settlements, you see all, all types of, of, sort of life under occupation. And, um, and uh, yeah, so, so then we had to uh, deliver the cauliflower to, wait for it, one more. Uh, there it is. It's just a lag. I knew if I clicked again, I would go too far. Um, so we delivered the call, the fried cauliflower um, to a seed bank. Okay, it was also in Beit Sefer. Why did we go to a seed bank? Well, um, this seed bank is also a voluntary uh, group, right? Um, it's created by a woman who wanted to preserve heirloom seeds in Palestine, and so she created this seed bank that. Um, that is basically a library of heirloom seeds. And she lends out the seeds to local farmers so that they can cultivate these seeds, grow traditional crops, um, and, and, and maintain um, you know, a, a, um, a, a local um, economy of, of local agriculture. Um, and she was hosting some international volunteers who were volunteering um, in the seed bank for a week and working with the local farmers. And so we had fried the cauliflower for them. Um, and then we also visited this gentleman who had created a social enterprise. Um, at least what he called a social enterprise. Um, and uh, this was an upcycling organization uh, that basically took what would otherwise be considered trash or rubbish or waste um, and created useful items from it, created some art, uh, etc. And um, in doing so, this um, this not only is good for the environment and cut down on waste, um, but also uh, provided jobs uh, for for people who were working in this upcycling group, um, and uh, worked to uphold, or at least you know I don't know if we would say uphold or create um, a local economy. Right. So much of of Palestine's economy is based on imports. Um, and so the, the effort here was really to, uh, to create a more local economy. And um, I also learned during that day in Beit Sefer that the tour guide operator, or the tour, yeah, the tour group operator, um, his voluntary group, collaborated every year with a community foundation, a Palestinian community foundation, um, to bring members of the Palestinian diaspora or you know, people in the solidarity movement um, to Palestine uh, for for an extended stay to um, work on all of harvest, to do some volunteering, to go on some tours, and basically just to to learn about life in Palestine. And so during this single day in Beit Sefer, I was introduced to those three types of groups that I mentioned earlier: voluntary grassroots organizations, you know, the tour group, the the seed bank, etc., um, social enterprises, the upcycling group. Uh, and community philanthropy groups or community foundations. Let me take each one of those in turn. Let me know if it doesn't turn. So voluntary grassroots organizations. Let's try it again. 
Huh. That's, that's where I want to be. So voluntary grassroots organizations first. Uh, youth across the West, West Bank. And I, I, I use the term youth very loosely. Um, so youngish people <laughs> across the West Bank um, are, are establishing, uh, I, I think we are part of youth, so there we go, um, <laughs> uh, are establishing these voluntary grassroots organizations. And they're engaging in a wide variety of activities. Um, I mentioned earlier, hiking, running, cycling groups are proliferating. Community farms are all over the place. Um, arts and culture groups have proliferated. Char Some of these voluntary groups are engaged in charity. I mentioned um, groups offering political tours. So a wide variety of activities, right? They share a few things in common. Number one, they refuse to register as formal NGOs. And number two, they refuse to accept foreign aid. Okay? So that's how they're united. Um, but what does hiking or farming or dabka dancing, for example, have to do with social change or anything political, right? I mean, these are fun activities that are drawing lots of young people together. But yeah, okay, it's great to go for a hike. Well, how is this at all about social change? Well, in Palestine, actually, this stuff has a lot to do with social change. So let's take those hike, hiking and cycling and running groups first, right? that organize weekly, often weekly, um, depends, uh, often on a Friday, which is the equivalent of a Sunday here. Um, you see people hiking, cycling, running around the West Bank. Um, and well, what does that have to do with social change? Well, it's about a right to movement. Right? So when Palestinians walk the land, when they hike, when they run, when they cycle and encounter checkpoints, um, when they encounter settlements, um, when they move, they are expressing a right to movement and they are expressing a right to uh, claim the land. Um, in addition, often these groups uh, engage in, in trash collection, right? So um, a running group, for example, will organize a run, but it's not just a run. It's a run when we're, everyone carries a, a trash bag or a rubbish bag and, and picks up trash along the way. And this is seen as, again, preserving the land of Palestine, taking care of the land that that is that is that is theirs. Um, uh, hiking groups often hike to villages and sit with village members to hear stories of, of the history of the village to preserve memory, um, and also uh, do volunteering with members of the community um, to build solidarity between you know, the kids who might be coming from some of the cities and, and going into the village to learn lessons, to build some solidarity. So, so this, you know, this, these hikes, these runs, they, they actually become relatively political acts. Farming is a lot about food sovereignty. Um, as I mentioned earlier, much of the economy in Palestine is, is, is constrained. It's, it's, you know, Israel regulates everything that comes in and goes out. Um, Palestinian farmers argue that, that Israel dumps produce into Palestine to obliterate a local market, um, and, uh, and that, that the produce that is available is not as healthy. Um, and so there's an effort underway by these farmers to create, by, by, and again, it's often young people, um, to create a, a local agricultural economy, to support local farmers, to preserve those heirloom seeds. And it also goes back to, you know, claiming identity when we're, uh, you know, when we're cultivating local crops, when we're eating recipes that were made with local crops and local produce, um, we're preserving an identity, we're supporting local farmers, we're claiming the land. And then arts and culture is also about preserving identity. Um, dabka dancing uh, is a you know very traditional form of, of Palestinian dance that is that is very popular. Um, traditional costumes are used. I don't know if costumes is the right word, but traditional dress, uh, traditional dances, um, lyrics are used to um, to express uh, political. Um, uh, uh, topics, for example. So arts and culture is also used as a, as a means of, of preserving identity, of, of, of um, embracing political change and, and, and political action. You can see, obviously, some quotes from my, from my interlocutors here. 
So these groups are. Um, let it goes forward. So these groups are are bringing young people, youngish people together, around shared interests um, in activities that are ostensibly um, that are ostensibly pretty benign, right? But that are in fact highly political and really about social change, quote unquote. Um, and they've been. Uh -huh. They've been relatively successful in doing so. So thousands, tens of thousands of people are, you know, liking these Facebook pages. Now, it's one thing to like a page. It's another thing to actually engage with one of these groups, right? Um, but as I said, I've been on a lot of these hikes and runs, and I've gone to these performances. I've harvested the crops. These things are really popular. These groups are really popular. Um, the, the weekly cycles, those are limited in size because of the number of cycles that are the bicycles that are available. Um, often the, the hikes and the runs are re relatively, you know, they have to, you know, be relatively limited in size because they're busing people from across the West Bank um, to a similar starting place. So there's only so much room on the bus unless you can find your own transportation. Um, these things are regularly sold out early. Um, Dabka dancing is one of the most popular uh, uh, extracurriculars now in, in Palestine. I don't know if, you know if extracurricular is too formal a word, but anyway, it's super popular. Um, uh, farms are mushrooming, popping up <laughs> all over the West Bank. Um, uh, there's, there's real movement here, right? Um, and uh, as I said, you know, there's, there's real movement to bring people together um, around um, resistance, around solidarity, around um, a concept called sumud, which is steadfastness. Um, but these groups also face challenges. So on the one hand, they're very committed to volunteerism. They're very committed to working without funding. Um, one of my interlocutors works for one of these, or not works for, is a member of one of these hiking groups. He said, we need to work without funds so that we are not under pressure to do what we don't want to do. We are free to do what we want. There are many organizations like us doing things just because they want to. From 2011 to today, we have no funding. We use volunteers, people who want to help. But then you see another quote here. Um, from a member of a, a volunteer at a community farm. And he said, it's not easy to appreciate how hard it is for voluntary groups to start and to keep going. Sustainability was a real issue. First, there was the issue of sustainability in the fact that many of the people who had created these groups, um, they had created them when they were university students and you know they were graduating and they were, Get, you know, getting full-time jobs and they were really busy and they started to build families. And so they really wanted to pass the leadership, although many of these groups also said, okay, we're leaderless, but there was still some sort of leadership going on. Um, they really wanted to pass the leadership along. So who's going, to, who's going to spend the time, the energy to keep these groups going? But they also realized that they needed some money, right? The, they needed money for, the, the, for their costumes, for... Um, for tools, uh, you know, agricultural tools. Um, they needed money to maintain the bikes. They needed money to bus people from throughout the divided West Bank to a, a place to start uh, for a run or what have you. So they really needed some money. And so this was a real challenge for these voluntary groups to be able to sustain themselves. So as a result, a number of youth had created, instead of voluntary groups, oh, I think I'm going. Yeah, okay, social enterprises. Okay, um, and social enterprises are basically defined by my interlocutors as, as groups that are created first and foremost to make a social impact and secondarily to earn a profit or at least earn enough money to sustain themselves. Um, and there are lots of examples uh, from the Palestinian case. Uh, for example, um, an a fair trade organization that supported, um, oh, that supports really, um, local handicraft makers from throughout the West Bank, throughout East Jerusalem, through Gaza, um, really throughout um, all of Palestine. Um, 
a um, an organization that works on water efficiency. They use uh, innovative technologies to um, decrease the the amount of uh, flow or waste, uh, you know, wastewater or, or water that's sort of lost in irrigation systems and in municipal water systems. Um, so, um, yeah, to, to uh, improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of, of irrigation and municipal water systems. Um, an organization that promotes vegan lifestyles, which um, you think about, you know, I guess we're, I think we're currently in the month of Ramadan when um, at the end of the month, there will be a lot of slaughters um, of, of animals. Um, this group was actually promoting a vegan lifestyle, which is seen in, in Palestine, in, in, this, in this society as being um, you know, a very challenging lifestyle to live. Um, but they were arguing that, okay, this is good for health and this is good for animals as well. So they were working on animal protection. Um, a leather uh, social enterprise, a, a group that worked with leather um, and, uh, and, and, and handcrafted leather goods, um, and employed women embroiders who no longer faced a demand for embroidery. And so how could their skills be repurposed? Well, um, I'll tell you one thing. The, the, um, the tobacco, the leather tobacco cases that, that this leather shop produced were really, really popular. Um, and so, you know, the women embroiders were embroidering um, these tobacco cases and, and other, you know, Leather fanny packs are all the rage these days. Um, and uh, also a cultural magazine that started out as a magazine and then expanded to be basically a space that has become a hub of, um, of arts and culture and of community-based gatherings in Gaza. So lots of different examples of, of so-called social enterprises. Now, whether they're actually making much money is, is certainly up for debate. Um, and and, and many of them are not, but, but they're really committed to trying to be financially sustainable while also, and first and foremost, making a social impact. Um, so why social, or yeah, why social enterprises, right? Why create a social enterprise? Well, A, sustainability, um, but B, um, I heard time and again, well, we're creating a social enterprise because NGOs are so discredited. So one interlocutor said, in Palestine, nobody trusts NGOs. Even NGOs doing good work have bad reputations. In the past, people created NGOs overnight in order to get funding. They jump from topic to topic based on donor. They have no long-term vision, so nobody trusts NGOs. Our business is, or, or our business saving water is social impact. But, of course, these groups encountered challenges as well. Um, first of all, there was great social pressure not to create a social enterprise. Um, this was seen as a lifestyle that was really alternative. Um, young people felt tremendous pressure by their families, by their peers, to get a job with a salary, buy a fancy car, buy a house, raise a family. Social enterprise really didn't lend itself to that type of lifestyle. But it wasn't just peer pressure or parental pressure. It was also pressure from universities, um, some of which actually house social enterprise incubators, um, but where a, a number of faculty said, oh, this is just um, propagating neoliberalism. And here in Palestine, I mean, we, this, this sector, this social enterprise sector talks about leadership and sustainability. But what are leadership and sustainability under occupation? We need to be focused on occupation, not on sustainability. So there was real pressure and pushback um, on these. And so, so what we've heard now is that, okay, there's a rise of VGOs, voluntary grassroots organizations. There's a rise of social enterprises, but they both face real challenges in sustaining themselves and in growing. And so what do we also see? Well, the rise of basically incubator organizations, organizations that support these voluntary grassroots organizations, that support these social enterprises, both community philanthropy groups and social enterprise incubators. And you see um, Build Palestine is one of those. On the community philanthropy side, community foundations are essentially organizations that mobilize local resources, right? Often we tend to think of fundraising from local community members, but it's really about local resource mobilization beyond just money. Yes, money, 
also local other forms of local assets, right? Mobilizing local resources. Interestingly, in Palestine, these community foundations are mobilizing both local resources and international resources. They have gotten themselves connected, sometimes because their leaders actually spent time in the international sort of philanthropic community. They're connected to the international donor community, to the Global Fund for Community Foundations, <laughs> to the Mott Foundation, to other um, big time philanthropy organizations that are actually funding these local organizations. But what's really interesting about the community philanthropy groups is that it's not the international donors who are deciding where the money is regranted. In fact, it's local community members who are making decisions about how the resources that have been mobilized are in invested. Um, what are the local priorities and where is the money used? Social enterprise incubators um, have created crowdfunding platforms. It's really difficult to get money um, into Palestine. And so they've created their own crowdfunding platforms that are, that are able to mobilize resources from around the world, from the diaspora as well. Um, and they host fellows programs, right, that, that support budding social entrepreneurs. Um, and these organizations stress that it's, it's not about the money, it's about the process. Um, that, that it's really about community decision making. Um, and Oh, there we go. Um, yes, that it's about more than money. It's about locally led community based decision making, right? About where any resources are invested. Now, I would argue that this is not, or I do argue, feel free to push back, that this is um, not just a, um, a phenomenon that exists in Palestine or that exists in the Middle East but that it really is a global phenomenon. And it is so for a few reasons. Um, so first of all, we've seen a small <laughs> proliferation, um, but in this world, it's actually a big proliferation, of books written by scholars who are, who are criticizing big time philanthropy. You see some of those here. We see organizations adopt the hashtag of shift the power. This was really popularized by the Global Fund for Community Foundations, I think. Or at least they've been a big proponent of it. Um, suggesting that the power, the decision-making power in sort of the international aid regime needs to be shifted from the international donors to local community members. And we've seen the popular press, including outlets like the New York Times, calling for the decolonization of foreign aid. And international donors are jumping on board. Um, it's a trend these days in the international donor community to um, localize foreign assistance, right? So rather than a top-down process through which, you know, as I described earlier, international donors lay out their supermarket of projects and, or, and local organizations pick and choose, um, let's, oh, and, um, and, and a process by which, uh, you know, international aid organizations uh, make multi-million dollar grants to big contractors and international NGOs. Let's get more money into the hands directly of local organizations, right? Um, and USAID offers a good example of this. So current administrator Samantha Power in, I think, November of 2000, 2021 laid out in a policy speech that by 2030, 25% of USAID's funds would go to local organizations. Now, how, does, how is that defined? Um, and, and who cares? Okay, 25%, that's only a quarter of the agency's funding. Well, that's up from 6%. Um, perhaps more importantly, um, or as importantly at least, um, Administrator Power committed to, also by 2030, incorporating local voices into 50% of the agency's programming. Again, what does that mean? Well, let's see. Um, and other organizations, other foreign aid donors are, you know, they're getting, they're, get, they're jumping onto this bandwagon. There's the grand bargain in the humanitarian sector that's more about localizing foreign assistance, right? Um, but there are challenges to that, too. Um, Okay, USAID, 
we could argue it, it, it's called a foreign aid organization or an international aid organization and others like it. Really, these are procurement organizations, right? They procure contracts. Um, they make, uh, they give contracts to big organizations to do the projects that they want to have done, as I explained earlier. Um, they're also structured in a way that makes localizing really, really, really hard, right? USAID has a big budget, a massive budget. It needs to push a lot of money out the door every year very quickly um, uh, in order to maintain its budget. And it needs to report every year on the results that were obtained by all that funding. And so what's the most efficient and effective way for USAID to meet those two goals, to push a lot of money out the door and to show results to Congress who will then refund it the next year? Well, give a lot of big grants to international NGOs and contractors who know exactly how to make those reports um, and who can demonstrate impact in one year. Um, there's also a cultural shift that has to happen in these agencies, right? These agencies are filled with um, highly educated, um, you know, Ivy League graduates who have advanced degrees in things like global health, human rights, political science, right? These are the experts in democracy, in development, in health, right? And you want these staff members to suddenly say, wait a minute, maybe we don't know what democracy means at a local level. Maybe local people know better what democracy means? You want to try telling an American political science major that? I dare you. <laughs> um, but that's the type of culture that needs to be overcome. So this is a real challenge. Also, to what extent do these local groups actually want foreign aid, right? Um, some do. Some of my interlocutors said, you know, when I asked them about these localization strategies and localization commitments, some said, well, you know, it's tricky because we need money and, and we applaud foreign donors for recognizing the distortions that the top-down approach has caused and for trying to localize. Like, we applaud that. But just as many were very skeptical and said, sure, of course they're localizing because where is real action taking place these days? No longer the NGO sector because the foreign aid has already co-opted that sector. Now it's in grassroots groups. Now it's in social movements. So foreign aid that wants to just maintain the status quo and does not want to see a major upheaval um, any more than there already is uh, in the Middle East, they're not going to fund these scrappy grassroots groups who are trying to foment change. No, they're going to co-op these groups with this localization. So there's real skepticism on the ground. Aid is seen as hushing money to maintain the status quo. Um, this local work can also absolve governments of their responsibilities. Um, it was around the, the holidays last year, I was, I was reading the New York Review of Books and I, I saw this piece that was written by a, a woman who, had, who was volunteering in, uh, in Poland, working with refugees. And, um, and she said that she'd created this voluntary group and she said, well, this was great. And then suddenly the government started saying, well, if you're gonna provide services to the refugees, great, we don't have to anymore. And then there's a question of impact. And who is joining these groups? So AirPods, right? Why AirPods? Well, I mentioned before that I went on a lot of these hikes and runs throughout the West Bank with these voluntary grassroots organizations. And, you know, we rode, as I said, we rode a, a little bus, a van, uh, to the starting point. And on the bus rides, I saw a lot of these. AirPods. And so how many youth and what population of youth are these voluntary groups actually bringing together? Is it just the kids who can, you know, uh, spend their Fridays cycling around the West Bank? Who can afford to do that, right? Um, I also want to argue that NGOs are not the devil. NGOs have really taken, I said they take, they've taken a beating. Well, they've certainly taken a beating in my talk. <laughs> but look, NGOs are really, as I said, walking a tightrope, right? They rely on, far, especially in Palestine, where there's no local economy, they rely on foreign donations in order to survive. And what does foreign aid entail? I walked you through that, right? They need that money to survive. And yet they're deeply committed 
to local communities. And so how does an organization walk that tightrope? Also, these NGOs have the ear of the international community. They often have the ear of local governments, albeit that gets tricky, right? But they are the ones, these VGOs that I'm talking about, these hiking groups, the international community is listening to them. So can we reimagine what we think are like realistic goals for NGOs? Maybe NGOs aren't doing that work of, you know, de Tocque, that de Tocqueville idealized, right? The, of bringing, you know, of being really, really locally rooted and, 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 and cultivating habits of democratic citizenship in everyday people, right? Maybe some are doing that, but maybe we can say that, well, these NGOs, maybe if, if the VGOs are, if the voluntary groups are doing that work, if, right? And if they're doing so effectively, can NGOs serve as somehow a bridge? Maybe this is just idealistic, unrealistic thinking on my part, but can NGOs sort of serve as a bridge between those local groups that don't have the ear of the international community or that don't have the ear of policymakers and the policymakers, the decision makers themselves? Is that, is that something to think about? So let me conclude um, by laying out some questions as we think about what does the future look like, right? Given the opportunities, given the challenges, given the trends that we see, what does the future of social change organizing look like? Um, question mark. So thank you again. And I look forward to a um, really provocative discussion. I hope you'll push back um, on, on things that I've laid out here. Um, I hope you'll point out where there's much more nuance than what I presented because there is more nuance than what I presented in one hour, right? Um, and I just hope that we can have a thoughtful discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for, for this fantastic talk. I have many thoughts on it, but I will give a floor to you first. Please, any question, any comments? And could you introduce who you are, please, uh, before asking your question? Yelena? Hi. Oops. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Yelena Vasilievich. I work here at the Institute. And um, I don't really have a, a, a fully baked question or comment because I was thinking a lot while you were, while you were talking because in the first part of your presentation, it was impossible not to make many parallels to, to our situation, to our context here. And um, also because of the, 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 the flourishing of the critiques of donor-driven NGOs. And also we have another context, and that is the context of Europeanization and democratization, when NGOs became the motors of, of these processes, especially of Europeanization. And then they, they became, they saw themselves more as, uh, as agents of um, agents of implementing uh, a key or different chapters that uh, were being opened here, and not so ready to to fight for and not so ready to articulate the citizens' demands. And that was the, the basis of, of many criticism. I'm sure because I know that you're, you're working on, uh, you're now fellow at um, Effective Political Science. And maybe you've read the article by Adus and Fagan when they criticized, for example, and they explained the absence of environmental NGOs in protests against uh, uh, Belgrade waterfront. They explained very well how actually this process of Europeanization made them complicit with what's going on in the government. And then, of course, then we have, um, alongside this critique of NGOs, we also have the uh, observation of the emergence of new civil society actors. So we can say, okay, we have these professional, the, the NGOs, they are professionalized, bureaucratized, they're uh, primarily responsible to their donors, but then we have some new social actors and they want to, they want, they want to actually articulate the real citizen grievances, et cetera, et cetera. And then we put our intention to that. And of course, many of these things like community farming, uh, cycling, hiking, uh, you know, kind of building community together, that's kind of closer to citizens' needs and they fulfill some, some sentiments or some, but it's, it's hardly political, right? It's really, it was even, um, in a way, you know, the, but it, it it has to be justified as political, and then it turns out in almost 
um, ridiculous statements like our songs have words like martyrs and freedom, hence it's about political liberation. Well, it's not. I mean, when you, when you go back to, to, um, to, to nostalgic feelings of people who were involved in the 70s and 80s, I mean, that was the, the, about political liberation. Singing songs about martyrs and freedom is not about political liberation. And it is true that, you know, the, for Palestine, like the major thing is occupation, right? So if you want to talk about contentious politics, if you want to talk about grassroots mobilization, it should be about that. And of course, the question is then, uh, how do we transform I don't know if that's the question. I'd, we we have all agree that there are some major tectonic changes within the paradigm of NGOs. We all know that. We all agree on that. And then we pose the question, okay, we are seeing now many different trends. We are seeing different organizations mushrooming. And then you're re really right to say, okay, maybe a solution would be for already established NGOs to kind of act as a bridge between new local initiatives and foreign aid. Maybe that's an idea. But does that answer the question will it lead to social change? If that's the major question, like, is the major question, okay, we want a civil society that can bring about social change. I think that's the major question. And then we came to an agreement that already exists, the, the, the ecosystem of NGOs is not leading to that. A as a matter of fact, on the contrary, it's actually leading to status quo, it's cementing the status quo. Then we have some new social actors, and then there's a hope, okay, so maybe they can bring some social change, well, I'm not sure, I mean, for, for what you see, it, they're not bringing it about. So we, in a way, what we, I think that we as scholars, what we like about the idea of NGOs, it's precisely the civility of the civil society. I think that's what we are grown accustomed to like about it. It's so civil to, you know, to, to be in this fight. In this, um, and then we kind of came to realization that the fight for social change may not be so necessarily so civil, and we are not ready to accept any other fight than civil fight, right? So we are kind of, uh, we we'll helplessly, you know, we're, we're, we're so, uh, we, we, we want, we are desperate to find a way to keep the old, you know, the old paradigm of civil fight for social change, and to, to, to bridge it together with this need to look for some alternative, alternative actors. And I think that what is going on, and by embracing these new forms of, of grassroots activism in Palestine, it's only contributing to, uh, to continuing with the status quo in Palestine, to continuing the status quo with occupation, right? So we actually should be, I think that we should be open, as scholars of civil society, for example, we should be open to admitting that the civil society consists of of many different, I mean, it's everything that does not belong to the state, to the market, is within the sphere of civil society. It does not necessarily have to be civic, you know, or, uh, and I think that we should be open to that. And I think that also this, this new trends of philanthropy, community foundation, it's not really new. It's just an effect of, right. it actually belongs to the old paradigm. It's yeah. just the effect of our disappointment with so obvious donor-driven logic, yeah. but actually it's within the same package. You know, yes. It's not something yes. radically new. No, yes. it's the same, and it comes to the same kind of critique. That, that we so I don't know if that's a question or just uh, because I'm, I, I, a lot of I, I deal with, with civil society in Serbia and in this region, and very much I'm really these topics are very important for me. So it's always trying to to think about how this this talk and this discussion could be helpful for for us here in this region. Thank you. Thank you, and and I, you know, I'll just I, I see um, more questions, but I I just want to pick up on this. This I really appreciate this, you know, point about civicness, and is you know when we look at civil society, to what extent do we um, do we idealize civ civicness, and to what extent does civicness serve us um, in terms of of real social change, and 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 again, how do we foment actual social change? Um, I don't, certainly don't have answers to that right now. Hi, I'm, I'm Nathan Koshel. I'm the director of Catalyst Balkans, um, a nonprofit here in Serbia uh, that works regionally to uh, to measure uh, levels of domestic giving and to understand how the uh, uh, domestic resource mobilization is happening throughout the region. Um, I have a couple of questions. So first off, there's a, a ton of nuances that can't be covered in one hour, so we'll forgive you for the strict categorization. But how, however, oh, I yeah. should also say, like, uh -huh. just yeah, like the, the 
the, the, the categorization of NGOs, VGOs, yeah, yeah. often it's so fluid yeah. that, yeah, so forgive me. Yeah, so no, there's, of course, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a spectrum. So, um, and so, you know, in your, in your, uh, your, uh, your framework of how you presented the situation in Palestine, my organization fits into the, the, the NGO that thinks like a social enterprise or something like that. However, one of the things that we recognize, yeah, see, there you go. <laughs> let's just call it that. Um, what, what, I wanted, what, what I wanted to ask, what seemed to be missing from your presentation was the opinions, the opinions held by VGOs, NGOs, and other interlocutors towards their local and national government as much as they, because what I heard from you, um, VGOs don't want to register and don't want to take foreign assistance. And those two things don't automatically go in my mind. Those things don't automatically go together. One, for me, from the framework of Serbia, is that's just about tax avoidance, accountability avoidance, avoidance ah. of getting into the system, and therefore you have to be less accountable rather than more accountable. Um, working in an informal system, and indeed most of the VGO examples that you gave, it appears that they are actually earning an income. They're renting bicycles. They're selling their services to, to various people. They're raising money community-wise. How are those transfers being done? If one of your VGO uh, people said, oh, it helps us to keep us more accountable, what are the accountability mechanisms if they aren't, if they aren't registered with government, which means they can't have bank accounts, which means how are they, how are they doing all of the work that on the other side of the pressure, global pressure that we have about being transparent and about being, um, as, as civil society, being a part of both accountable to citizens but accountable to government. So that would be one question I'd like to explore is, yeah. um, and it goes to the second issue is why VGOs exist. Why are sports clubs being organized in the VGO context? Why are folklore clubs being organized by our hiking clubs. Is there something that the state system, because it's under occupation and is involved in this huge struggle, is that something that isn't provided by the state system and therefore uh, you have these groups that are emerging? Here in Serbia, you have a combination of those types of clubs being A, funded by the state, being run by, being run as companies, even if under the context of sports club, etc., and then also just being a conduit for outreach to vulnerable groups and then run as a nonprofit. So it's a question about how those services are done and what is it about the need for that um, that, that causes them to provide those services in place of whatever else should, should be doing that, whether it be state or foreign assistance, et cetera. And then the third question, the third question I have um, is, is about the definition of social change um, uh. and, 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 there was a comment that you made and then something that Yelena made uh, about um, the, the, politi the politics of it. Is social change inherently political? Um, if, uh, if, I, if my organization wants to create social change by getting more, more, uh, more nonprofits engaged with their communities, that's one form of social change that can be measured by various levels of behavior. But, we also want to change the legal framework in this, in, the, in this country and other countries. That's another form of social change. But we're not at all interested in big, big forms of social change that would be strictly political in nature. So is the, is the link between desires for social change always political in the context of a political system? I'll, I'll, I have nine more questions, but I'll leave it at that. It looks like Ilyana has a two-finger. Is your, yeah. uh, do you want to build off of what yes. you saying? Go yes. ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Catherine. This was really inspiring and provoking in a way. Um, uh, I would like to uh, comment uh, on some of the issues uh, mentioned also by Ellen and by Nathan. My name is Biljana. I come from Track Foundation. Um, and uh, in local circumstances, we actually deal with uh, a lot of issues that you mentioned mentioned here, and namely supporting grassroots, working on uh, supporting social entrepreneurship in the 
to support civil society activity as well as uh, working on uh, community philanthropy uh, development and uh, community foundation specifically where we also cooperate. Uh, to come back on the social change issue, uh, well, not to say similar to Nathan, you know, we don't want to get into the big political. I would rather argue that every social change is in effect you know, it has its political aspect to it. The question is to what extent, um, and that is to yell in a status quo uh, uh, argument, to what extent are we creating a social change uh, or desired social change could be evolutionary or revolutionary? Um, and in effect that um, where you have the political systems in countries that may not be Palestine or may not be Serbia, which, how to say, uh, fulfill the, the democratic, you know, checks and boxes. Therefore, then the social change can work more in the evolutionary, uh, you know, manner. But in countries, for example, like Serbia, and I can only imagine how it must feel in Palestine, where you need the complete dismantlement or complete change of a political system, the question is, however uh, one contributes to the social change, and I believe that all these be it NGOs or volunteer organizations have their role, uh, it can have a limited effect because it does not come to the root of, 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 of causes. But on that still, then there is a question. If it does not contribute to uh, a, a real change, uh, what is the change we are seeking? People need to live. You know, are we standing still before everything changes so things can be better for everyone? Or are we trying to create change day by day, you know, to kind of, you know, keep uh, lifting the ladder? So I would argue that, you know, however it does, in effect, contribute to the status quo, and here I agree with Yelena, I think um, given its role, it cannot, I mean, the, the, the um, civil society cannot change everything. It needs all other actors in society. It needs a complete, you know, uh, change of these political circumstances. Uh, however, it does maintain a status quo to an effect. It does contribute to, to social change. I mean, it, it contributes to its mission. That's, that's my opinion. Should I take each one? Okay, thanks. Um, Nathan, your point about government relations is fantastic and accountability as well. Um, so, and, and it's sort of, you know, it, 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 it flipped and maybe it, it, it certainly advanced, but also maybe flipped the way I've been thinking about that. So, um, so you know, these groups talk about um, avoiding the, the restrictive NGO law in Palestine and also um, you know, avoiding registering with the Israeli authorities, but then talk about their encounters with, right? Because there's no way to avoid encounters with either form of government. Um, and, you know, they will argue that, well, the Palestinian Authority is just as discredited as international donors, so why would we register? You know, we just, we reject all of this, right? Um, but I really appreciate your point. And they talk about, well, we're not accountable to the donors. We are accountable to the local citizens. But how do they show that, right? I've thought about it in terms of metrics. Because they'll say, because I've asked, you know, how do you prove that you're having an impact, right? And how do you, how do you show that you're actually advancing social change, right? And they say, well, you know, we use our, our Facebook page to tell stories. It should be about stories, not about metrics, right? That's a nice thing to say. Um, and, but, but it's an easy thing to say, right? It's a very easy thing to say. And I had not thought about the financial accountability, which you're right, right? Like, you know, these, these groups, they're not collecting a lot of money. Let's say the, the cycling group, for example, right? They don't collect a lot of money, but they, they collect, I can't remember how many shekels it was to go on a, Ride, but you know everyone must pay something to go on the ride, and and that pays for the upkeep of the bikes that are used, the helmets, the transportation, you know, the van, and and but we don't know how that. I mean, it's ostensibly used for those things, but what's it really used for? We don't know. Um, so the financial accountability—that's a really important point. And, and you know, these organizations—it's easy to take a, a moral stand. Ah, you know, we reject the foreign aid, we reject the government, but. 
You're right. Then what are the accountability mechanisms, right? And they'll talk about being accountability to local people, but how do they show that? Um, oh, why do they exist? Are these services not being provided by the state? What what these what these what the members of these the members and leaders of these groups would say is that it's not really about the running. It's not really about the arts and culture. It's about volunteerism, and it's about steadfastness. It's about revitalizing that culture of organizing, of volunteering. So it really doesn't matter what we're doing as long as we're building that culture, which is what they would say would not exist in the government-sponsored or, or aid-sponsored. So that's more why they exist, not the service itself. Um, now, social change. This came up the last time I was here, too. How do we define social change and who gets to decide um, you know, what, what social change um, looks like? Is it necessarily political? I mean, the easy answer to that, uh, easy, right? The, the, the sort of flippant answer to that in, how, in the case of Palestine is, well, everything is political, right? Um, hiking, running, da, 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 it's all political. Um, but I really also want to pick up on this point of evolutionary versus revolutionary, right? And, and different, you know, different people involved in this business of social... Oh, that was the wrong word. <laughs> Sorry, let me scratch that. Different people who are involved in trying to advance quote unquote social change um, would I think argue different things. That we you know we need we need revolution or it's we're just perpetuating the status quo. Yeah, it's nice that we go and we take these hikes and we encounter checkpoints, but we're not dismantling the checkpoints, right? We're not um, we're not whatever it is. Um, it, we're, we're just having some fun hiking. On the other hand, we do have to live under occupation. We like, do we just stop our lives um, and stop having fun and stop trying to uh, to cultivate this? And so, and, and I think, you know, we need both. I mean, my perspective is that we need both, but who cares what my perspective is? What do, you know, what do, what do local people think is, you know, again, what do social change actors um, think is the right approach, and, and how are they going about it? But go ahead, please. Because I think you were the one who asked this question when I was here last time, right? What does social change mean? I think I did. I think did. Uh, Adriana Zakharyevich from the Institute. Um, I wanted to, in fact, ask you something, two thoughts from what you said, and not about as big a social change. Oh, okay. One is that there was this poster for a walk, political walk, I think. Okay. Um, which was the price? The price of the walk was one thousand dollars. So who walks? That's that's the first exactly, question, right? That goes back to the AirPods question. Now, and that was a diaspora. That was a diaspora thing. So it yeah. was like we're gonna, you know, students from America will pay a thousand dollars, and that includes like the plane, you know, all of this. Like, well, no, it doesn't include the plane ticket. They probably have to buy a plane ticket too. But that's exactly right. Who walks? Right? Who's coming? So it's the diaspora, in fact, who helps this national feeling and the preservation of culture to be there in the first place, right? So that's that's my first thought. And the other thoughts, which, I mean, both are related with what is social change in the end. The other one was uh, related to the social entrepreneurship, where it was said on the slide that it's too Western and that the professors from, from the university were saying that the, the, the students, in fact, just wanted to buy a car, get married, have babies. So I guess that's not Western. Or what is that? I mean, is that the traditional way of life in, in Palestine or wherever in the world? I mean, to have a car. <laughs> I mean, that's a, so it, it's really like... I understand and I agree. I mean, it's what you do is really necessary in the sense of, okay, there is something wrong with NGOs, but so what then? If we don't want a revolution where we're going to go and smash the checkpoints and go in the, I don't know, armed struggle directly, what then? But then the images of, of who gets to fund, yes. and there is a funding involved. And participate. And participating and also a little bit like a political tourism I mean that's it's somehow awful to think about it and then also this other what is Western and what is not Western and um, to have a car is is what the traditional way of life and what car 
It was a. It was. I remember when I was way too too wet in ideas. It was like people, the students are not interested in joining. Sorry, please interrupt. No, no, no. That's that's how. No, because up from what I when when that quote was there, I didn't understand it as they don't want Western social interpret. They want want our local things to get married together. I didn't understand it that way. I understood it as. Uh, students are not interested in being active at all. All they want to do is get married, have a car. That's how I understood it. It's not like cherishing our values to have a car. The, the other, the other quote was from the other professor. Yeah, two those two, quotes. those two were relatively separate, right? They were getting the peer pressure to get the family, get the car, and then separately, professors were saying, "Ah, oh, this social enterprise. This is just neoliberalism. This is just like." Too Western. I just abuse the mic. Yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> just to contribute to this because I get the impression that my intervention was not in the direction of saying, oh, um, but this is not radical enough or this will not bring about social change. No, I mean, it's every every change is fine. Every change is good as, as long as it brings something good for the. I was just thinking of it scholarly, now completely scholarly, not as a polit polit political activist. This is not a new paradigm. It's not a paradigm shift. That's what I was saying. Okay, it's a new kind of. Something new is going on. We we understand there's criticism to the, the old ways of functioning of NGOs. Now we have some different, but it's not a new paradigm. That's all. Okay. Now we are shifting towards community foundations, towards those grassroots movement. But it's all within the same paradigm. That was my my idea. And that same paradigm is that NGOs are not there to bring about political or grand social change. That's not, it is fine. It's not what they are about and what should they should be about, but it's just staying within the frame. Whereas what I think is that maybe we as scholars of civil society should be ready to embrace other forms of contentious behavior in the public sphere and to also take that as a credible object of study of civil society. That was my intention because these objects, they all belong to the same paradigm. So I was thinking yes. as a scholar yes. of, 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 yeah. of yeah. yeah, not as a, as, a, as a moral, it's not a moral criticism, it's not, a, uh, it's not like a value judgment or anything. Um. Yeah, and I, I, Yelena, I really, you know, I, I'm thinking back to sort of like the literature that that I tend to be sort of ensconced in in, in civil society. It's it's it is all around this, and whether it's NGOs or grassroots groups or whatever, but it's it's all about a very civic form of organizing, whatever the form is, right? Whether it's the scrappy grassroots or the da da da, it is very civic. It is very, we could say, non-revolutionary. It's it's very evolutionary, and so thinking about getting out of that, yeah. But but going back, I, I totally appreciate your point about like who funds social change, who participates in social change, and who participates in social change in different paradigms of, of thinking about social change and thinking about civil society. But absolutely, like that's why I said like and a and there's so hard to do nuance in one hour, but like you know, what I'm presenting here is is a very stark and provocative and unnuanced and, and therefore not telling the whole story of any of this, right? That that it's that the VGOs are not just the, the glorified new groups, right? They are um, you know, uh bringing together kids with AirPods and, and uh people who can pay a thousand dollars, you know, from the diaspora. The NGOs are not the big bad NGOs, right? Um, and there's there's really a lot of nuance and fluidity between what even is a VGO or an NGO. For example, there's a DAPCA troop that relies um, almost exclusively on volunteers, but they do have some paid staff. They do have to pay their rent for their building. They do have to fund their travel. Um, and they do take some international donations. They won't take it from USAID, but they will take it under like they will take some general operating support from some inter international donors so are they a vgo when, when they have staff and take some aid you know it's hard to say thank you very much <clears throat> yeah thanks for your talk my name is Rizim Podanic. i'm also from the institute so um yeah I uh, uh, I think that when as scholars we usually tend to think that uh, uh, social systems are somehow you know like inherently unstable more than in fact that that they are 
uh, we tend to proclaim something as social. Oh, look, this is a social change. Like this should, so it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a rather problematic. I think that it's okay to say that this is not bringing about fomenting social change, it's about coping. Uh, and coping is fine, because for social change you need some kind of contradiction, some, some kind of crisis. And what's inherent in crisis is that you never know which instances of coping or social engagement will in, in fact be uh, disproportionately influential. So it's a not a linear thing. This is what we know today about social change. In instances, uh, there's a beautiful book by Sylvia Volby called Crisis. So when you have a, a, a system in perturbation, when you have a system in stability, then uh, a small, uh, a relatively small acts of engagement produce uh, uh, disproportionately large social change. And you never, this is why coping is fine. You know, not everything is social, some, some coping is okay. But on the other hand, I also, <clears throat> and this is true about Serbia, uh, more often than not, these uh, instances of social change, organizations of social change, conserve stuff. So like, we are bringing about social change by conserving seeds or conserving the waterfront or conserving this or that. So I think it's kind of weird that we have this, you know, that there is, so if, if, if social change is a, is a scale, it also has a direction, so a progressive conservative, and this is somehow in between, I don't know. It, it seems odd and it seems that some further research should be done. So why there is something like a, a thought about innovation, yeah? so something which is not conserving stuff. Uh, so that's, that's the first question. And the other is a technical one. So <clears throat> there is this, a huge new um, opportunity created by the internet for Pat, 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 Patreon as a pr platform. So I don't know if there are instances where there is, there is some kind of crowdsourcing as a way of going around this issue of, of, of avoiding big donors. So like, I, I suppose that it's already happening, but I, I would like to know uh, how does this new technical opportunity modifies the, 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 the way in which VGOs and NGOs work. Thanks. It's a great yeah, I'll take the second one first. That's the easy one. Uh, well, easier. Um, so yeah, crowdsourcing is big, um, but there's also some really interesting work on like, um, so 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 on the one hand, technology uh, provides a lot of opportunities, right, uh, for smaller scale donations, for bringing people together in quote unquote solidarity, for you know spreading the stories about what these VGOs are doing, the impact that they're having, their accountability, blah blah. Um, but but it also um, creates a surveillance mechanism as well, and so and there's been some work done on sort of you know digital surveillance, particularly within Palestine, and and, and you know by whom that's done. So so it, it both opens this you know uh, opens opportunities, but also challenges regarding surveillance. Um, uh, um, but yeah, and then picking up on the, you know, the, the idea of, you know, I talked a lot about preserving heirloom seeds, preserving traditions, preserving, you know, arts and culture, and how is that about social change? And interestingly, you know, I think, I mean, in, in the particular case of Palestine, this is where, you know, making generalizations out of a particular case really breaks down, um, is that, you know, these, these groups are saying, okay, well, we, this is, this is, um, uh, this is really about um, getting to a, a, a more radical social change that, that did exist before, for example. Or this really is about, um, if not social change, at least preserving what we have, rather than allowing further encroachment and, and the taking away of what we have, right? So it's if it's not necessarily social change and maybe that's the wrong word for me to be using and you know i said this is a tentative title of book i've heard enough questioning of this that maybe it really is not the right word to be using um that more like that concept of smooth or steadfastness is the word that should be used um and so i need to give a lot more thought to that but that might actually be the case that this is not necessarily change but this is an attempt to prevent further encroachment. And in reality, it's probably both. 
Thank you. I don't know if you have just one quick question, if there are any. Oh, please, here you go. Please. Uh, so I would like to go to your imaginary world in which the angels are uh, bridges between the uh, big donors and the uh, locally led organizations. Yeah. So we, uh, we've seen from your presentations that the grassroots groups and uh, other uh, locally led organizations are critical of NGOs. But yes. what about the NGOs or how you call them? I think it's a good term actually, businesses, those that are in the business of social change because they, right, uh, uh, seems that they, uh, um, that this is a lucrative uh, business in, in Palestine. So uh, what about them? Do, uh, uh, are they reaching out towards these uh, locally led organizations? Are, are they trying to make these connections and are they successful in that's a really interesting question, and, and what I often found, thank you, Boyana, is that um, often members of, like staff members of NGOs in their spare time are members of the voluntary groups. And, but that they do see a separation. They see a separation. And, and again, Palestine, I would say, is an extreme case. In the NGOization case, like, these, these groups are really, like, it... As I said, it's a very, very lucrative, very professional industry. Again, it has to be. There are just so few local resources. Um, they have to be reliant on these foreign funds. And so it really does become this industry. And um, so what they say is that, like, okay, we hold our, we, we need to earn a salary. Um, we have a family. We have a house. We need to pay the mortgage or whatever it is. We need to raise our family. We have to work, the, the NGO is the best job we can possibly get, right? It's, it's better than working for a law firm. Um, I mean, it's, it's and, and it pays better. And so in order to survive, we work for the NGO. And in order for our soul to survive, we join the VGO or the volunteer. You have to tell me if the VGO term does not work. I sort of came up with it and it might be, I see Russia laughing, it might not work. <laughs> anyway, do we work, you know, it, you know, do we, and, and we feed our soul through the voluntary group. And they really, they seem to see them right now as very separate, which is where, you know, I, I'm very skeptical of this idea of NGOs as the bridge. Um, uh, but I'm also trying to figure out why exactly I'm skeptical. Um, that's my inconclusive answer. Thank you very much. Great. Ida, please. So I kept thinking about the formality. And then you just sort of opened that uh, can of worms in the wider discussion. So, so um, informality. Um, what different hats? What different roles do people have uh, within these? Who are the people in these organizations? Right. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Janine Waddell. Janine Waddell. Janine Waddell wrote a book, several books, but. Uh, the one I'm referring to here is the shadow elite, okay. where she worked, um, her, her topic was actually on, on uh, US government and US international development uh, agency people switching from different uh, positions. So they worked, say, in uh, a big, um, let's uh, government agency for a long period of time and then they then they switch to the business sector and they essentially use the connections all of these informal relationships to build uh, a very luc lucrative uh, i think she mostly focused on shocker uh, sort of military forces and, and and their roles but she uh, coined the term flexing so people that can flex their social connections from one uh, one hat, one role that they have into another. Uh, did you see this in your work? So, and may, is this something that could be fruitful for, for thinking? Because um, one thing that's very common here in Serbia is the importance of informality. It's so, um, I work uh, on monitoring several uh, projects that are current, by one of them is a big you know, UN project how the project and the project activities actually take place and when, whether or not they're successful really, really depends on who knows who, yes. right? So, you know, 
is it gonna work yes because i know the police officer working in in that city uh, uh is it not gonna work no because we don't know anyone working within the government and, and i think that's where sort of that question about the government comes back in right what's the role of governmental organizations who who are the people right and what are the informal connections not so much the institutions whether they're formal in the sense that they're registered on a piece of paper that we're always we here we're talking about institutions organizations who are the people and are they they are they flexing to use what else term uh, thank you very much and thank you for introducing me to new work um so the people vary but yes Definitely flexing. Like I mentioned earlier, that these um, the the two most prominent community foundations, and I say prominent, I mean they're not that prominent, but whatever. Um, you know, they're one of them. The 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 founder of it worked for the Ford Foundation in Cairo for ten years, and so how has he managed to fund this organization that um, that then you know uses community based decision making to decide where the funds are granted? Ford. I mean, <laughs> he worked for Ford. He's got connections all over the place. Um, and he's using those again to bankroll this community decision making, this series of community decision making processes. So, so there's that, for example. Um, NGOs, I mean, the way to get anything done in the NGO sector, like to, or to pass you know, where you need to pass is to know somebody in the Palestinian Authority. Um, absolutely. Um, the, again, the NGO staff are, are volunteering in these uh, voluntary groups by day. Social enterprises, how do you get, um, how do you work with municipal systems to, to improve the efficiency of their water? Well, it's got to be, you've got to have connections in the Palestinian Authority and in local government in order to do that. Um, another interesting point of connection, I would say, is actually collaboration between, nobody asked about collaboration between the voluntary groups, of which there is quite a bit, actually. Um, and I often saw, and this gets to like, okay, sometimes we can think of collaboration as enhancing impact. If these groups are working together, well, maybe they can have a greater impact. But it also gets to, I think, the point that it's a really small group of people, right? I, Go to, go to the an open mic night of the of the spoken word group, and you see the same people who are going at least some overlap, right, of the people who are going on the hikes. And so it's all just the same people who are in this community of so called whatever we're calling it. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a, a rocky discussion. Right, right, right. It can be productive. Yeah. Productivity. How do you get anything done? Because as you said, it, it's I mean, then you just call it the book of uh, well, then, uh, how Russia really works and how they say that. Yeah. It, that's informality. Yeah. And it's not particularly like right, you know, in the sense of current action, but it's just really a sense of informality. Yes. Yeah. Do you have enough, please? Uh, I'm also Nevena from the Institute, and uh, thank you. Um, actually, the main effect I got from this presentation is a bad one. Like, there's a lot of accusations, not, not your work, but no. uh, there's a lot of accusations between yeah. people. And as we are now speaking, they are all overlapping. I assume there's a small percentage of people even active in this sense. And uh, I would try to uh, maybe understand the context as a uh, there's a lot of scarce resources. It's a scarce environment. So uh, people, especially in this sector, are all striving for some kind of people power, to, uh, not just uh, to have uh, anything to eat, to have car or families or whatever, but any type of power they can get to make decisions. So uh, I, I'm very sad to hear a lot of accusations between each other. But I don't know if it's like because they had a chance to speak up with you about it, uh, or is it really uh, so bad uh, thinking of each other because that these are the same people. The same context is here in Serbia. We are all shifting through all different kinds of organizations because we know each other. Like when I got into formal NGO, Prat Foundation, I got to know people from political organizations, from local uh, BGOs. Uh, so 
they are all a part of the system and when we are perceiving the world as wild and low in low scarce environment uh, maybe we we are not striving to pluralism like we are having one mind that only ngos or only ngos on, or only uh, radical uh, changes so uh, what do you think is this genuine like do, do they really accuse each other all the time or it was just uh, some this you were a ventil for them is ventil in english also a vent for them to to rent that's a really good question and and one thing i really hate about this project is that it is so it involves so much accusation right like the the people in the voluntary groups oh they're accusing the ngos of of corrupting civil society and oh they accuse the foreign aid of corrupting the ngos and and then the ngos say yeah well but i mean it, there's just so much accusation going on here and and you know ultimately it's a little hard for me to know the answer to your question right like it was i just hearing that because i happened to be asking the questions my sense is that and i really appreciate your point about scarcity right there is so much competition for funding for legitimacy um i i think i used the word prestige earlier like okay our social problem is the most important social problem therefore donors should fund us and not you know the other ngo um but i and i i really think that you know largely this this probably does come down to to, to a, a, a a um a a a problem of of scarce resources um and 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 scarce legitimacy as well and and scarcity of anyone actually even paying attention to palestine um you know the palestinians feeling okay well like Obviously the Americans don't care about us and the international community, you know, others in the international community claim to, but they're they're off signing the Abraham Accords right now and and where are we? Like um and so so a scarcity of all kinds of resources and attention and and yeah, I I, I mean again, I don't know the answer because I don't know if, like what's happening when I'm not there. <laughs> um uh but I really appreciate the question and the point about scarcity. Thank you. It, it, it's it's a tough to make any uh, progressive uh, progress on what whatever the way you choose if you are seeing the world as so wild. Uh, so yeah. maybe that's a, a future shift in their mindsets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any? Yes, please. I just wanted to uh, talking about the. BGOs, as you call them, uh, informal groups. Just uh, a question: uh, Is there? Uh, did you uh, notice a difference? Is there like two tiers of these informal groups in terms of their maybe longevity, like more traditional ones, and then these more up and coming? And do they work together? How how does it work? I mean, that's a really good question, and and you know many of them. I mean, in terms of longevity. That's a really good question. I mean, I mean, they're relatively they're relatively newly established. I mean, I would say, well, let's see. So I started this. And they're not that new. I mean, if I started this research in 2016, and I will say that I was often like I saw the same ones year after year after year, um, and and the same ones being active. Um, but then again, see, you know, it was easiest for me to find the ones that were sort of the largest and therefore longest lasting. And so, you know, my assumption is that there are also plenty of little ones that I never was tuned into that propped up or that popped up and then went away. Maybe because they, you know, didn't have have that, you know, that flexing with the government. I mean, I'm actually thinking of a running group now, right, that that started just a group of it was a group of female friends who in Nablus decided they should be able to run in the streets on Fridays. And more and more and more started joining. Well, now if you go to her Facebook page or the, the group's Facebook page, like there are pictures of the you know the mayor of Nablus uh, there at the the thing and 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 celebrating the run. And so, how is this you know prolonging or in, and enhancing the the longevity and the sustainability of the group? Um, these are these are questions that I don't necessarily have the answers to, but really important questions. Thank you. Okay, Alexander, please. 
Hi, it is nice to be able to see you and hear you again. I'm also um, a researcher of this institute. And basically, I just um, have a reflection on everything I heard today about um, the topic that you were presenting about. And that is that perhaps in terms of uh, political community, we could be perceiving NGOs and VGOs as well as institutions uh, as social actors. And the entire process we could be uh, perceiving as um, an act of resilience, basically an adaptation to ever-changing environment. And um, speaking about the Serbian experiences in building civil society in during the 90s and, and early 2000, um, most of the NGOs uh, that were active then were actually uh, uh, of the of the think tank forum, and those think tanks actually <coughs> served as um, an alternative safe haven for those people and those activities because it was impossible for them to to do their work uh, within the institutional framework. So it was a way to to um, secure survival of the people, professions, activities, and in very essence, we are actually uh, speaking about democracy <laughs> when we are looking into things like that. So um, I would um, rather um, look into videos as a reaffirmation of democracy, in a way. It is basically uh, as they are saying, look, we are here to, we, uh, we do not uh, um, approve the way things are being done within institutions or NGOs. And uh, we want to do some things at least differently. And this is how we are doing it. And we are actually achieving small victories. So, yeah, it's all of this. I just wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. And that gets to one of my preoccupations, which is what does what do we mean when we talk about democracy and who gets to decide? Um, and and, you know, so often the, the international community thinks about democracy is like, you know, again, changing in the, the political institutions. But but do we also see democracy, as you said, as as people getting together and saying, OK, we the the institutions that exist are not serving us in the ways that we would like. It's a huge preoccupation. Thank you. Talking about informality, I would suggest that we continue this thought-provoking conversation informally. Thank you all very much. Thank you to Catherine. It was really great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. And, uh, and